Hey Alchemy University, welcome to module 1.4. Today we'll be covering blockchain structure via analyzing the blockchain network ac architecture. So if you see on this graphic, let me get out of the way here. Uh, we've seen in this module, traditional server architectures are usually centralized. That's more the web two kind of traditional architecture, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Usually you have a bunch of nodes, computers, AKA computers, making requests to some centralized server, right? Some, some really powerful server that contains the master kind of copy of everything, right? Now, if you go further along the spectrum, a blockchain arch architecture, many, many people think it's decentralized, right? But this decentralization is not what a blockchain is. The blockchain actually builds on a decentralized server and makes it all distributed because the blockchain actually ends up being a peer-to-peer -peer network, meaning all nodes are actually interconnected to each other via other node connections. So a blockchain's architecture or network architecture most closely resembles this third one, a distributed network architecture, otherwise called a peer-to-peer -peer network. So here's just another graphic. Uh, you know, traditional server-based, where you have a central server that contains or controls most or the only copy of a ledger of data. But in a peer-to-peer -peer based network, every computer or every node has a copy or a local copy of the data that is shared amongst all the participants in the network. If any participants dis disagree, then that is where we get into decentralized consensus, right? which we'll cover. So in the reading for, for today or for module 1.4, there were a couple of Q&A components that I'd like to go over. So for review number one, question, how did distributed P2P networks, peer-to-peer -peer networks, agree on what data is valid without a central administrator running the show? So without someone like a central server making sure that every copy is is valid, right? How do, how do these peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, that are distributed, if there's no central actor saying, yes, this data is valid, yes, this data entry is valid, no, this data entry is not valid, if there's no central administrator in this show, how do they agree on what data that is added by any of the nodes is added, is valid, right? Because otherwise it'd be chaos. Everyone would be adding data, you know, what data is allowed to be added, what format of the data is allowed. That's usually something that is measured by a central administrator. So uh, this, before we get into the answer, this is actually a problem that Satoshi ran into and many other computer scientists have run into before. It's actually a computer science problem called the Byzantine Generals problem. Some people pronounce it Byzantine Generals. Uh, the problem that it outlines in a computer science context uh, using historical reference is how do people or how do nodes or people coordinate in a decentralized environment, right? That's the problem that, that actors in a decentralized environment face. The solution, which we've outlined, outlined in module 1.4, is proof of work. Proof of work is a consensus mechanism that allows nodes all over the world to agree on what data is considered valid according to all the network, right? So will this Byzantine Generals problem is covered more, more briefly in its own video segment, but I just wanted to cover that this is the problem that Satoshi essentially solved with proof of work consensus. But anyway, for the answer on how to distributed P2P networks agree on what data is valid without a central administrator, uh, that is, again, the consensus mechanisms. So uh, just to use the Bitcoin network as an example, the Bitcoin network decides validity of new data based on who is able to produce a valid proof of work. And we covered that yesterday. So uh, review number two, how is the block hash calculated? So this might be, again, review from yesterday. So what happens is a hashing function takes data as an input and returns a unique hash. So here we have a SHA-256 hash generator. And what happens is these blocks, or when someone proposes a block, it's usually just something that is, you know, or better said, when someone wants to find the block, 
they actually end up hashing the raw data contents of that block. So say this is our block, and we'll say that, you know, the prep hash, let's say I'll, I'll, I'll just fetch one from Blockstream, and I'll say the prev hash of the block. So say we're building on the on the Bitcoin blockchain, we'll, we'll link our candidate block to the prev hash, to the previous block hash, right? So we perform that link, boom. And now we also want probably some data, right? You know, in our block, we want some data, which usually in blockchains takes the form of uh, transactions. So just this will not look great, but let's say transactions typical like Bob sends Alice 10 Bitcoin and, you know, whoops, Charlie sends Bob two Bitcoin, et cetera, et cetera, right? Notice how with every single input that I'm changing here in this little input box, a brand new hash is produced. So this is exactly what happens with a block hash calculation someone just inputs data into a hashing function and they get a block hash out of it, right? Well, they input block data, so they get block output or a block hash out of it. So here we have a prev hash linking our candidate block to the previous hash. We have some data, you know, some transactions. And now what usually happens, and again, this is review from yesterday, is there is a nonce field. Also typically like, you know, we're skipping over other important stuff like timestamps, which is usually some big number in Unix, which is the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. But here we have a nonce, which is usually initialized to zero. And this is the, again, this is review from, from 1.3, but this is the, the hashing process, right? The miners will perform this, increase the nonce by one, and every time it changes that block hash output, right? So that is, essentially answering our question. How is the block hash calculated? A miner just constructs what is called a candidate block, a block that they want to add in the future, and then they, they hash it many, many times until uh, what is leading on to our next question, a valid hash is found. So review number three, what is a valid hash? Typically, uh, you know, depending on the blockchain, a valid hash for a blockchain is a hash that meets certain requirements, right? So out of all of those output hashes, the, the software automatically checks whether that hash is valid, right? So some simple ones that are common across blockchains is one, the block index is one greater than the latest block index, right? So, you know, in our little hashing sequence, we missed a little, you know, say the index. So if our prep block was 752927, now our next block building on it is 752928, right? So that gets us across the first requirement. Then the block previous hash equal to latest block hash, we do have that, that's great. Uh, block hash meets difficulty requirement. So this is where it gets difficult and this is where the mining actually happens because this is where the miners must toggle this nonce field millions and millions and hundreds, you know, hundreds of millions of times in order to find a hash output that meets a certain difficulty requirement. Notice how in the Bitcoin, you know, I have block Blockstream pulled up here, which is a Bitcoin block explorer. Notice how if I toggle any of the blocks just recently, they have a bunch of zeros in front of, you know, as part of the hash output. This is where the difficulty comes in. What the Bitcoin network requires is that any person constructing a candidate block must actually construct it in the way that this input data produces enough leading zeros in the hash output uh, to qualify, to, that meets the difficulty. Now the difficulty is actually just saying, you know, uh, you, can, you have to find 19 leading zeros in your hash output, but it's, it's really just saying you have to find the hash that when you turn into an integer is lower than this than this target kind of difficulty. And that is that is that is what actually changes in Bitcoin's blockchain every two weeks, right? The difficulty is readjusted based on kind of minor sentiment. So, whoops. And for the last one, that the block hash is correctly calculated, right? So you, you can't really cheat it. 
you have to, you know, correctly calculate it, I'm assuming just means that all of your all your fields are, you know, correct fields and you're not missing any of them because it would be a bummer if you found a valid proof of work, you know, you spent considerable electricity and resources mining a whole block and you find 19 leading zeros, but guess what? You forgot to link the prep hash or you forgot to include a valid timestamp, stuff like that. So that is what is referencing. And now uh, I'm not gonna go into it because I'm already at 10 minutes, but the reading has to go through the blockchain demo, but I just wanted to introduce it. This is fantastic. It has you go through a lot of the important stuff of a blockchain by actually kind of leading you through construction of your own, right? It actually starts you off with like a Genesis block and it, it starts you off with like common definitions for blockchain terms. You know, blockchain is a list, a blockchain has a list of blocks and it starts with a single block called the Genesis block. So this is the demo. If you next, next, next all across, this is the demo that I highly recommend you do. I also reference it a lot in the reading, but uh, just as a, you can skip out of it and just start playing with it with your, with your own blockchain. So notice how it has, you know, every block, this Genesis block, in particular has some data usually usually this data takes form in like bob sends alice five bitcoin notice that it's it's becoming red because i'm not meeting with the hash output of my data i'm not meeting the difficulty requirement of this blockchain in the demo it says that this blockchain requires three leading zeros in the output so i'm just going to command z back to that first initial and you'll notice that the hash is now three leading zeros and it and it likes it. So now we can add new blocks on top of it and you'll notice that all of the properties, all of the properties that we talked about here, you know, to make a valid hash will appear here in the blockchain demo. So let's say we add a new block and our data is, we'll actually copy it from here. Bob sends Alice 10 Bitcoin, Charlie sends Bob to Bitcoin, whoops, and I'll add the new block. And what happens is uh, we have our prep hash, right? We're linking to the Genesis block by linking that hash inside of the block calculation, which cryptographically seals that link. And then we have a hash, a block hash for this own block. And again, it meets the difficulty requirement. And the cool thing about this demo is that it shows you how many hash attempts it performed in order to find that difficulty requirement. So 940, quite a few, but you know, not bad for three leading zeros. And so you keep on adding and adding. So I encourage you guys to play around with this, with this blockchain demo. And for the next module, I'm not sure why it signed me out there. For the next module, we'll cover, uh, we'll cover the UTXO model and the account model.